17 is where we're at. Okay, Daniel 1, uh, 17, and let's go ahead and pray. Lord, I do ask that you would help us to understand your words, and at this part, uh, this next verse where we just uh, recognize that we are to ask you to give us skill in learning, and help us to have skill in understanding and skill in learning so that we might understand your words. In Jesus' name, amen. I hear that voice. Okay, uh, Daniel 1. Okay, remember Daniel is like the Old Testament parallel of Revelation. Uh, At the end of the book of Daniel, he says he's going to seal it up to the end. Okay, and then Revelation is the end. So a lot of, the closer we get to, quote, the end, not the end of the world, but the end, tribulation, uh, the more Daniel is going to be revealed. Okay, and remember that Daniel and his three friends were four fellas, four young boys of uh, how many thousand? Let's see, 40, I'm sorry, 4,600 people. Okay, so 4,600 were brought from Judah to Babylon, and we know the names of five of them. Daniel and his four buddy, three buddies, and then Ezekiel. Ezekiel's... Uh, would have been the second captivity. Okay, now in Daniel 117, we got down to 117 and we went, I went through the, the uh, health test that Daniel uh, asked Melzar to be a part of and they passed the test. And then it says in verse 17, as for these four children. Now the Bible doesn't say ages for that word. Okay, but when we think of children, what do we think of? What is that age? Okay, in the Bible, you'll have an, uh, a babe, a child, okay, children, young men, uh, then not adult, adults not found in the Bible, then a father, and an elder, and an agent. So he's got seven stages of growth as far as the Bible goes. Okay, and uh, so it goes, I, I'm sorry, on child, it should be little child. So it starts with a baby, little child, children, young men. So I would say in our age, classifying young men would probably be 15 to 25. Okay, and then fathers, and then uh, elders, elderly or elders, and then aged, that's above the elders. Okay, that's the seven that uh, Paul will use. Okay, so children here, and we often, when we read through this, we, I think we tend to assume that they were older. Okay, but children, I would say no more than 15, maybe 12. Okay, I'd say if you have a 14-year-old, depending on their height, you know, if, it, if it's a Peterson, you know. How old is that one? 12. <laughs> If it's Lindsay. <laughs> okay, but uh, uh, as far as children, I'd say let's, let's make them 15 at tops. 15 at tops, anywhere from 12 to 15. I would say that still qualifies for children anywhere from 9 to 15. And uh, this one in particular, Daniel, uh, evidently was a thinking child where he thought about some things, and he was determined enough in his heart to uh, stay true to God, even though he's lost his family, lost his culture, uh, been uh, attempted brainwashing for three years, and no doubt was praying through the whole time, asking God to let us go back, let us go home, where's dad, where's mom, where's this, where's that, and never getting the prayer answered in the affirmative, Uh, and so that's the guy. So that tells us that, you know, young kids can have convictions. And at your age, you should need to develop some convictions, things that you're going to stand for. 
Okay, and so begin to develop these things in your own spirit. And I don't care when you make this pact or whatever you want to call it with God. It doesn't matter what your friends say. This is what I'm going to do. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> when I was a kid, when I was 10, 11, 12, 13, something like that, I, at that age, thought uh, on occasion, not too much, but on occasion I did think, I thought about being a father someday. And I thought about... Uh, how I would try to be a father. I thought of that as a 12-year-old, 13-year-old boy. And I would kind of think about what I'm going to do when I get to that very awesome position in life. Okay, and so here we have asked for these four children. <clears throat> God gave them knowledge. Okay, so God gave them knowledge. So if God, if, we, if a person doesn't have knowledge, what should we do? Ask God for it. James 1, verse 5, if we lack wisdom, let him ask of God. So God is the one that gave them knowledge and skill in all learning. Okay, now notice it's not just learning. There is skill in learning. There's a technique to learn. There's uh, a process that a person can increase learning. Okay, a lot of times we have to learn things a second time, the third time, the fourth time, the fifth time. Why? It's because we didn't pay attention the first time. Now there are some homeschool methods. I don't, you know, I don't not pro or con against them. There are some homeschool methods that absolutely do no homeschooling for the kids until the child asks. Okay, now. Uh, you know, that may be late. They still don't know how to read when they're 9 or they're 10. But when that child says, I want to learn how to read, and if they start at 9, they catch up with the others by the time they're 12. And the reason why is they have desire. Okay, they have a desire to learn. How many of us adults recognize that we didn't learn algebra the way we should have, or this math or that one or this class or that one, and then we had to face up... What is a uh, fraction? Okay, and then we had, to, we had to go back. and I can remember teaching algebra in Colorado Springs where I got to a page. What is this? So I went out in the hall, came back in and tried to teach the thing, <laughs> trying to refresh my memory. <laughs> okay, and uh, when the desire is, is, is manifesting itself, that's when a person truly learns. Okay, our public school system teaches that if you have a kid sit on his rump for 180 days out of the year, and he does that for 12 years, then he's going to be qualified to get a diploma. And how many of them know how to read? You know, a lot of them don't know how to read. Why? You cannot force anybody to learn. It has to be self-desire. Whether you learn from a book, whether you learn from a parent, whether you learn from a grandparent, whether you learn from sitting at a desk, formal education of a teacher, all learning is valid learning when the person has the desire. And the thing is, is we can create a desire in our own heart. I want to learn something. Okay. Or the teacher tries to create a desire in the heart of the child to desire to learn. Okay. And so it's a skill. It's something you have to develop. Each and every one of us. And when you develop this skill, you learn quicker. And then you can go outside and goof off when you want. Okay? Instead of daydreaming in class about goofing off, how about paying attention in class? And then you can goof off without having to worry about the homework or the work because I goofed off and didn't pay attention in class. <laughs> Probably the worst time of year for school has got to be May. I mean, putting a boy in a classroom in May has got to be a wretched sin. <laughs> okay? And that's why the best education is always in a free enterprise. The public education has compulsory attendance. They have a forced curriculum. Who, who decides who, what are you supposed to learn? Who makes that decision? Somebody does. Okay, where if education was put in the free enterprise... Totally and absolutely in a free enterprise, and it was up to the parents to choose the schooling. Any farmer would love to have a break of schooling in October and May. Why? To get the kid out in the field. 
And if that way a farmer can get the education for his children as he chooses, if you're living in a farming community, okay, that way an atheist, if an atheist wants an atheistic education, hey, they can pay for it. If a Christian wants Christian education, they can pay for it. Okay, and a matter of public education, it's not public. The public doesn't have a say-so in it. If you think you do, try. Okay, and it's really not education. It's an indoctrination. You have to know this, this, and this in order to get out of here. Okay, and so the best form of education is in the free enterprise, and if a person chooses an alternative from the public schooling, then you're going to have to pay double because you're paying property taxes, which go to the public school, and then your tuition for private education, but your kids are worth it. It's worth it. Okay, and if it was all put in a free enterprise, it would be done cheaper, it would be more, more efficient, it would be better quality. Uh, years ago, I, I looked up how much tuition charge, how much it costs to uh, edu- educate a kid annually throughout each state. In Iowa, the annual cost, not counting buildings and all that stuff, just annual cost for the teacher's salary was almost $4,000. Okay, per child. So if a person had, and of your property tax, about 70% of that goes to public education. Okay, and so if a person had one child in school and they paid property tax of 1000 bucks, somebody else was footing their bill. Okay, and then you go to New Jersey. New Jersey, the cost was about $11,000 for public education. And the ACT scores, or the scores that they get for, you know, knowledge or whatnot, Iowa had the highest, and New Jersey had about the lowest. And they always try to tell us it's the money. It's not the money. It's desire. It's the desire either of the children or of the leadership trying to get someone to learn something. Okay, so these four kids, these four boys... They had skill in all learning and wisdom. Now, not just wisdom, not just learning. Wisdom is knowing how to apply with uh, the learning. That's what wisdom is. Learning is book knowledge, possibly. Wisdom is knowing how to handle the book knowledge, what to do with it. Okay, I personally, I, I think uh, young boys ought to do all they can to learn the trades. Okay, when I went through low high school, low high school, the Red Devils, okay, I uh, figured, okay, I'm going to take the minimum I have to take for college. I wasn't planning on going. Okay, I was just going to take what they say is the minimum requirements. And then I went to wood shop class, I didn't, and I took P&T class, which was small engine repair. And I didn't take welding because I can learn that on a farm. I definitely didn't do FFA because... You're raised on a farm, <laughs> okay? And the FFA teacher asked me why I wasn't in. I said, I can learn more from my dad. I come from you. And why well, take the time in school? And I took uh, house wiring, something very practical. And then, uh, what, 30-some years or I don't know how many years later, I had to refresh my memory in house wiring when I wired the house, the log home. But I initially got that from public school. And so when I looked, at, I looked ahead and I said, I want to learn some practical skills that I can be, learn to be at least a jack of all trades. Okay, some basic things. So uh, if you've got a, a junk engine sitting around, a mower, get the tools out and let them rip it apart. Tear it apart. Try to put it back together. Learn the insides of an engine. Figure it out. Get on YouTube and learn how to do it. Uh, one of the first times we bought a TV in our house was a five-inch TV. That's the first time we bought one. And I was watching The Fugitive, this old black and white show. And there was something bad on Jen. said, I'm sick of this. We're sick of this. And we gave Brent a screwdriver, and we said, take it apart. And, of course, he never got it back together. That was the intention. Okay, but he was trying to teach him something. Okay, and so uh, learn to work with your hands. Uh, Get a hammer and nails and beat some nails and some things. 
Uh, and so uh, just learning to work with your hands. Uh, ask some men that are, uh, have this field, ask them if you could watch or learn some things from them. Those practical things. I mean, today with YouTube, man, you've got knowledge galore. Don't know how to change brakes on a certain car, type it in, put it on YouTube, watch it, and then do it. Okay, those practical things. Uh, and that's what, uh, you know, I'm a firm believer that young men ought to be doing that until, if, if God calls somebody to ministry, that would be around 30. Maybe starting a ministry of some type around 30. I think that I'm pretty, you know, not firm on that. But up until then, he ought to do all he can to learn everything that he possibly can. Drywall, electrical work, construction, anything like that. Okay, and that's what, what a person does is you're learning a skill of some type. Okay, a skill in all learning and wisdom. And then it says, and Daniel. So specifically, this young man, Daniel, had understanding in all visions and dreams. So he picked him personally out of the four. Daniel had understanding. Now, understanding is the byproduct of what the Bible calls inspiration. Okay, all the Bible teachers will say inspiration. They'll use a secular definition from a, sec, from a, a Greek dictionary that got their definition from a secular pagan Greek. And they'll say inspiration is when God breathes his words. And then they'll limit it to the original autographs. That's not true. A lot of Bible believers even define it that way because it's hard to get out of a rut. The word inspiration is very easy to define because it's only found twice in the Bible. Very easy. Okay, and in the, in the um, 1828 English Dictionary, the Green Dictionary, maybe some of you got that, 1828 Webster, he'll get it on the third definition. He gets it exactly as the Bible states it. On the first one, he'll put God breathe. That's a secular definition. But on the third one, he gets it right. And what is inspiration in the Bible? It's when the Spirit of God gives you understanding of a selected passage. That's inspiration. That's why it's present tense. All Scripture is given by inspiration. So when you fully understand a passage... You don't add to, you don't subtract from, and you go, now that makes sense. You just was inspired by God. Okay, it's present and is given, just like in Romans it says the, the gifts of the Spirit is given. That's present tense. Just like in Ephesians it says the grace is given. That's present tense. Why do they not allow inspiration to be present tense? It's because somebody doesn't like the idea that that book is perfect. They don't like that idea. And I don't think it's wrong at all for you to pray a prayer like this. God, inspire me or give me inspiration or inspire the words that I'm speaking. I don't think that's wrong because what you're asking for is understanding. Sure, the words I'm speaking are not scripture per se. But the Spirit of God can use my words to bring understanding. And that's inspiration. Okay, that's if we stick with the Bible words on that. So this understanding is what came to Daniel through the Spirit of God, even though he did not know the Spirit of God was a member of the Godhead. Because they didn't know that under the Old Testament. Okay, he had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now, a vision usually is if somebody's awake and they had a vision. A dream is when they're sleeping. And this is how God makes his words known to a man before written revelation. How do I know that? Look, if you would, in Numbers chapter 12, verse 6. This is how God spoke to Abraham. He did not have a Bible. He did not have any written words. Neither did Job. Neither did Isaac. Neither did Jacob. None of these guys had any written scriptures from God. None of them did. So how did God make his words known to him? Numbers 12, verse 6, it says, And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. 
So how does he make his words known? Hear now my words. That's how he made it known to him. Does God still do that? I do believe he does. If people don't have a written copy of a Bible, and he still might, I'm not certain. Okay, but he obviously has limited, since we have a complete revelation. Okay, and if you have a dream that goes contrary to the Bible, then you can mark that down. That is not from God. Okay, if it, if it is aligns with the Bible, you might say, okay, it's God. Or it might be me. Hey, I got something to write. You know, even a blind squirrel finds an acorn. Okay, or something like that. So he had this understanding. Okay, this understanding came from God. So that's what you and I could pray for. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, I still think the greatest prayer uh, that we can pray for on this earth is, uh, finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified. Okay, free course is an, a term in admiralty law. It's when you have a favorable wind that blows the ship to the direction they want to go instead of have to zigzag where they can just let sail and go. And the wind is a picture of the Spirit of God. And so it's when the Spirit of God blows His wisdom and understanding onto the Scriptures into our mind. That's what inspiration is, and that's what we need to pray for. Okay, people, a lot of the scholars, the so-called scholars, when they don't understand the Bible, they blame the Bible. I don't understand it, so it's got to be this. So I'm going to go to this translation. Fine. How about blaming ourselves first? And then ask God to explain it, and you might be surprised what we find. Okay, the scholars run into this Greek dictionary and this Greek lexicon, okay, are trusting the definitions rather than this book. And that's where they're at fault. Okay, there's a guy on, on YouTube that... Uh, of all the guys got on YouTube at, at, that reviewed my Bible... Several guys have done it. I didn't ask any of them to do it. One guy had a warning, caution. And so he, he was a Calvinist. That was his problem. Okay, and so we've got a running tally in there going back and forth. But he trusts the definitions of the dictionary. I trust this book and how it defines its own words. This book has a self-defining dictionary. And uh, Gail Ripplinger has written a wonderful little book. It's called The Language of the King James Bible, where she gives multiple examples of how the definition for the word is either right next to the word, or it's within the context, usually within 10 words or 10 verses. The Bible defines itself. Okay, and that's how you get the right definitions. Okay, now these Greek guys, they get it from a dictionary, and they don't, they don't research where these definitions come from. And here's the game they play. You'll have multiple definitions. You get any dictionary. Okay, don't they have multiple definitions of words? Okay, if you go to a Greek dictionary, they'll have multiple definitions, and the person wants to accept the definition he likes best... And that becomes his own personal private opinion. But then they think it's scripture. It's not. It's their opinion. And that's how they base their uh, beliefs on. Okay, so verse 17, very important. What we get out of that is here, these are young boys, very young boys. They had some conviction. And these young boys uh, were given wisdom by God. They have skill in all learning. And that tells all of us that we need to pray for learning. We need to pray for wisdom. Okay, if you're having a hard time in school, how about praying before class starts? Lord, help me to concentrate. Help me to focus. Help me to get it. Okay, and, and see what the Lord does. I mean, it certainly can't hurt. We're not going to charge you a fee for it. Okay, so why not try it? Okay, so verse 18. Now, at the end of the days that the king had said he should bring them in, then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. So now, the head honcho is going to quiz these kids. 
And the king communed with them. Among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. Okay, the idea of standing before the king is because they know uh, decorum and things like that in a setting of royalty. Okay, so they understand certain things about that because they were taught some of those things. Okay, then verse 20, And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than the magicians and the astrologers that were in his, all his realm. Okay, now I don't know what these boys look like. None of us know. Maybe some of them had a very young look to them. Maybe they looked their age. Maybe they looked a little older. Who knows? But can you imagine the older men, the wise counselors of the president or the king, the magicians and the astrologers, as they're standing there 30, 35, 40 years old, 45 years old, who knows how old they are, and here's a 15-year-old kid, or if you throw him at 15 and get out at 18, here's an 18-year-old kid, and he's 10 times better than they are. Oh, don't you know there was some jealousy going on there? And boy, the jealousy they would have had. Okay, and that's why the jealousy is manifested later on in Daniel 6, where they did all they could to get Daniel. Okay, so the magicians. Okay, this is, uh, the short verb is magi. But notice the spiritual aspect. Magi astrology. Some of us are old enough to remember when Nancy Reagan, it was reported, consulted the stars when Ronald Reagan travels certain places. Yeah, they do that. Why do they do that? Okay, uh, in, the, in the Roman days, they would have a Roman priest. They would call him an augur, A-U-G-U-R, not like the augur on a grain. And this augur guy was a guy who would study the parts of a bird and predict the future. This is where we get the title inaugural address. And the reason why this is so true is because Daniel 10, as we get to Daniel 10, there's a spiritual influence over all politics. The spirits in the first heaven, I don't say they can control politics, but I do say they greatly influence them. And these people that get in these high positions, they are very spirit-minded in the evil realm. Okay, one of those emails that uh, was sent out to Hillary was from one of her cohorts and said that she was going to sacrifice a chicken to Molech tonight. Why? Because they had to pray to these beings to try to, I get get advanced intelligence. I have no idea. But that's the spiritual aspect about it. And this is what Christians fail to remember. And, oh, we got a Christian in office. How do you know that? We don't know that. When somebody gets in there, you know, the exception proves a rule. A King James is an exception. A Bloody Mary is the rule. Okay, and that's what we need to know and recognize. And so we need to... Never trust a politician, as the Bible says. Put not confidence in the princes, in Psalm 118 says. Sure, we're glad that if somebody with a righteous and authority, people rejoice, uh, uh, people rejoice. Boy, that's a great thing. Okay, and but yet our our trust is uh, obviously should be in the Lord totally, but. Here, the idea I'm getting across here in verse 20 is that there is an evil spiritual aspect of the political world. And this is why you see so many, uh, uh, not scams, but scandals going on. And a politician needs a good memory only for one reason, is to remember which lie he told the last time. Try to keep their lies in order. Unless they want to do it in the typical Nazi, fascist, communist ways. You tell a lie, tell a bigger one, tell a bigger one, tell a bigger one, eventually they'll believe all of them. 
And that's the, that's the way they do it. Okay, then in verse 21, And Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus. Okay, he continued uh, even under the first year of the king of Cyrus. That would be Daniel 6. Chapter 2, verse 1. Now, here's something very interesting. And in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, wherewith his spirit was troubled, and his sleep break from him. Okay, so as we keep going down through this. Okay, and this is God going to reveal some future events to Nebuchadnezzar. We'll get into the aspects of that. Okay, just to jump ahead a little bit. Okay, he has this dream. He brings in all the, all the, wise, the wise political consultants, all these consultants in, the astrologers, the magicians, the Chaldeans. And he says, I want you to interpret my dream. And they say, okay, tell us the dream. We'll interpret it. And he said, I forgot it. I want you to interpret my dream. And they said, are you kidding? Nobody can do that. He said, okay, then off with your heads. And he gives him the death sentence. And then Daniel was of that group. He was of that counseling group as a 19-year-old kid now. If we make him 18 after three and a half years, the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, now he's 19. And here comes Melzar to get, take him to the gallows. And Daniel says, what's going on? And he tells him. And here, a 19-year-old kid walks into the king's chambers and interprets his dream. And if I was a magician, would not I be grateful that this kid saved my neck? Well, we'll discover that, no, they forget that. Okay, but don't you know that was a slap in their face because here's a young kid from Judah that gave the king an answer that we couldn't get. And that's exactly what God does. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it says that he uses the base things of the world to confound the wise. And that way, God gets the credit for it. And we'll, as we read through this, we'll see that Daniel gives God the credit. And that's the best thing he could have done. Okay, so chapter 2, verse 1. And the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, wherewith his spirit was troubled, so it's a bad dream. We could say a nightmare, and a sleep break from him, woke him up. Okay? And if you have a good dream and you wake up, what do you do? I always try to go back to sleep and try to get back right back in where I left off, but never do. Never happens. Never happens. Okay? And so, bad dream, he's awake. And then he said, what did I dream? I know, oh, I, I, I remember, I, oh, I can't remember. Okay, then we'll see what he does. Then the king commanded to call the magicians and astrologers and sorcerers. So now we got an added party and the Chaldeans. So obviously you see all three of those magicians, astrologers, sorcerers have a devilish connotation. Why? Because... The devil is the God of this world. And he offered all the world kingdoms to Jesus Christ. And the reason why he offered that is because God has delegated them to him in this age. So that's why that is. Okay, Chaldeans, for to show the king his dream, so they came and stood before the king. And the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. Then said the Chaldeans to the king in Syriac, O king, live forever. Typical introduction. Tell thy servants to dream, and we will show the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The thing is gone from me. If ye will not make known unto me the dream, with the interpretation thereof, ye shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made a dunghill. <laughs> Those oriental kings don't mess around. Okay, if that happened in our culture, people would really be at it, you know. But in our culture, you've got to hire a rogue agent to get their hit. And then they take their hit to a disclosed location. They put them in this machine where it leaves no bruises or marks in the body. And it has a gun in it. The machine will take the gun right to their head. And it will pull the trigger. And then they'll take the machine off. And then they'll walk away and they'll say suicide. Or they'll take a gun and shoot it this way and they'll say suicide. 
Or they'll take a high-powered rifle, as LBJ was becoming president, and the guy was running across the field with some of the handwritten ballots, and a high-powered rifle will take him out, and they call that suicide. That's the technique that happens in America. <laughs> or the fella that leaked the information from the Democratic National <laughs> to WikiLeaks, Seth Rich, dies mysteriously, and then they blame it on the Russians. Okay, so that's the techniques in America. <laughs> Type in Seth Rich online and see the information about that. Okay, but in the Oriental Kings, again, Oriental Kings, they are different. Oriental people are different than we are. They have a different mentality. And uh, this king just say, hey, you, you can't tell me what I'm dreaming. I'm, I'm, hey, I'm a real cut up. Get the point? And he's going to hack them to death. He's going to have, obviously, somebody else do it. And then they're going to take the bodies, and they're going to push them in a pile, a dung hill, a manure pile, and probably throw some fuel on it and then torch them. And that king will probably go to bed that night like nothing ever happened. You know, I don't understand a, somebody with a conscience or a lack of a conscience like that. But there are people like that, and they're usually in political office. And a person needs to remember that. <laughs> That's why the Bible portrays them, and Daniel will portray kings and kingdoms as lions, bears, and leopards. Get online, get on some of the nature shows, and watch a lion kill its prey, and that's how often kings react. Okay, and uh, then false prophets are like uh, dogs, wolves, hyenas. Watch a hyena actually eat the prey when it's still alive, eat it from the back to the front. No mercy, no mercy or grace at all. all and this is how they've been programmed by God. You know, to them, that's nothing wrong. And God gives these illustrations to us I dare say to help us recognize our trust is in the Lord. Not in any government entity, none whatsoever. Okay, and uh, years ago in China, the, uh, the one who ordered the uh, army tank to run over the students in Tiananmen Square. I bet you guy that ordered the hit slept well that night. No concern. Why? Because they're evolutionists. So to kill another person is no different than a dog killing another dog. You know, I don't, personally, I don't understand it, but that's, like Jan says, that's where they're possessed with devils. Okay, we'll stop there. Any questions or comments when we covered? Okay, prayer requests.